So let's start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let's talk about uh, document modeling for MongoDB, but in fact, it's a general purpose discussion around documents and uh, a comparison with what you can do uh, against or when you compare with relational database tables and records. Uh, quick introduction, I am Tug, uh, working as a technical evangelist at MongoDB. Uh, a few experiences using uh, NoSQL and document databases, but obviously I spent nine years at Oracle back uh, early 2000. So my DNA initially was relational database, SQL statement, and I moved to document database. And it's quite exciting. So I put today a small agenda about uh, why document, working with the documents, the impact on the application developer, and what is interesting about, for example, when you have to update your database, when you have to change your schema in your inside your application. And some quick discussion around queries, around um, common patterns that you can see inside your application. So it's just an introduction, but it will give you an idea of uh, the differences between relational database and documents, on where, uh, on which kind of application or uh, feature you may look, look at when you want to build your application. So I'd like to start with why we are we talking about documents database uh, like MongoDB? One small interesting point is relational database has been built in the 70s like me, I guess, 40 year old. And they have been built initially with two things in mind. One, it's to kind of represent what the way they manipulate data, simple spreadsheets, but also to optimize the way you store data on the disk, because back at this time, hardware was very, very, very expensive compared with what we do today. So one of the key of relational database was to optimize using tables and columns, create simple tables with rows in which you will put some data. And when you have to add more data in relation to that, for example, you want to have this customer or persons in relation to their bank account, you could not put them in the same record because you, uh, a user could have multiple accounts. So you have to build and you know that better than me, you have to build another table on the join between this table, a relation between this table. And it's quite nice for this specific use case because we have users or customers and we have accounts and bank accounts. Very simple use case. But in reality, in real life, when you build your application, when you manage your data, it's often a lot more complex than that. Let's take an example. If we look at a product catalog, in this case, I'm using a very generic product catalog when you have many things coming from sports, electronics, uh, retail stuff, office uh, supply, really many, many things. And you will see that inside a product catalog, it could be very hard to design something for your database. We will take some sports stuff. Sounds good. A baseball bat. A baseball bat has some information about the length, information about the name, the diameters, uh, the type of metals or wood you use. So many, many things that you can represent. What do you do? You create a table for this specific product. When you design your application, you want to be sure that the names of the columns or the name of the property you manipulate are something you can understand inside your product catalog. So in this case, we see the category, a bat, the model, the name, uh, the brand, some information about the how it looks, how it has been designed, uh, the type, composite or wood, for example. It's great. So here you have a very nice product catalog for bat. You can do whatever you want, compare price, query, and so on. But you want to add different products inside your database. For example, you want to add gloves, so baseball gloves. So first, you still have the size, it's great, but you have the type of gloves, infield, outfield, pitcher, the type of uh, how you have been built, one piece, two piece, 
and many stuff again about the brand, how we had been built. So you can find some uh, data that are the same. But let's just create another table for gloves, just to show that we have some differences. So here you have the bat and the gloves. What are the differences? You see that we have all the technical description of each product that are quite different. Great. So far I have two tables. And you can imagine that you add more and more tables. Same for the baseball itself. So you add a third table. So you cannot manage that this way. So what do you do? This is where it's become complex to manage with, you with your relational database. One approach that we see quite often is you use a sparse table. So you add more columns depending on what you need inside your application. Even if you do that, you still have to understand what kind of is the limit of your product, what is the limit of your application on your database on the way you want to manage data. So it doesn't really scale. More product you have, more columns you will add, most of the columns will be empty at the end because you have so many different products that will make it very, very, very complex to manage. So you have another approach that uh, I will say it's smarter you use a key value store table that will be rel in relation with your main database. So in this case, all the command information are located in one single database, a product database, where you have the product ID, the table, the product ID, the category, model, name, brand, country, price, and so on. Then you have another table when you have simple, simply the property and the value and a link with uh, the initial product table, for example, you will see that here we have the bat in green, the list of the attributes, the list of the property for this specific bat in another table. But you see that here, if you want to get specific property for a specific product, you have to do a join, you have to do a complex query that you have to create. But also, it will be hard to associate specific list or complete, pro complete product of uh, a product that will be a set of sub of sub product. For example, here I want to buy a full equipment for uh, um, for the shield uh, for the for the player. So you have to be able to create a product that is a join or an union of many many stuff. So one product in this case is equal it's equal to a set of product hard to manage, you need to add more tables. But for example, you have, because you are doing an e-commerce platform, you have more and more product with more and more different types. So I want to have a warranty itself. So you will add what? Another tables? Another set of properties? So it makes very, very complex. And this is why in real life, you often see this kind of model or schema inside your database. And it works. I won't say that it doesn't work, it's just complex. This is hard to manage. Uh, this is hard. Uh, it's long time to develop, to make evolve, to have... Uh, it's hard to change. And this is one of the key parts here. It's very hard to change. And when you want to query specific attributes, you don't know if it's part of one table or if it's part of a, sp a property table or spe something specific on the other side of the schema. It's quite complex to build an application of it. So queries are very complex. And based on all these statements, you should have another way of doing the same thing. And also, what happens every time you change something in your application? What happens every time you build something inside your application? It's kind of a nightmare. Because we know how you add product, but suppose you want to add a different way of managing the product price, or add specific uh, uh, combo when you can add this product on this product. It's quite complex. And this is one of the reasons working with relational database in real life often, it's very hard to have a full agile development, adding columns, adding tables, changing the type, or mixing the type of specific attributes. So this is one of the reasons documents has been built to make the life easier. If you know the story of MongoDB, or if you don't know the story of MongoDB, it has been built by uh, two guys in New York. 
that has used to work in many startups. And one of the stuff they had is they have a hard time to work with a database. So they wanted to build a database that could not only scale, depending on uh, the number of users, the volume of data, but also that it should be very easy to develop with, and part of it should be easy to develop in an iterative way. Adding new features should be easy. Modifying the schema should be easy. So basically, if we look to the relational database and we compare we compare, sorry, high, um, as a high level with what you will do in the relational model compared to the document, you can represent a join inside one document itself. In this case, for example, I have persons, a list of persons and a list of cars, and I have a join between them. One person can have multiple cars. Basic relational model. In MongoDB, using documents, what you will do you will create one single document that contains a list of cars. So this is an oversimplistic approach. We will see in later on that you have many different things you can do, many options you can use. But basically, by doing that, you simplify a lot the way you will manage stuff. Because first, in one single call, you access to all the information without doing multiple query on multiple hardware, on multiple space, on disk. One single document is located in the same memory space, in on the same server, on the same disk. When you do that with tables and records and join, you don't know exactly how will the hardware will handle that. But let's take an example. Take go back to our example with the sport goods. So here, again, we will manage the gloves, the bat, and so on. So the same property you will manage in one single document. So you have fields. And one important part is you sometimes you hear that NoSQL database or MongoDB or other engines are schemaless. They are not really schemaless. They are schemaless in the sense that the database itself doesn't, does not validate the schema but your application manipulates a schema. Your data that you are storing inside the database have a schema. Typically, we have a list of fields. This is your schema, your application schema, but it's managed by your application code. So we see the list of fields and the list of values. On one important part, not only you have values and fields, but they also have specific types like string, numbers, and date. So this means that everything you manipulate inside your application will be stored using a specific attributes, will be stored with a specific types and specific value. So the same way you manipulate your relational database, your tables and records, you are building documents. Obviously, when, from when I say the same way, it's conceptually. From an API, from a Java programming language, you don't necessarily use the same API but you will use type and structure and, and uh, object in Java that you will be able to store as JSON document inside the database. One interesting part is, because we manipulate documents, you have more options in the, in the way you organize attributes and values inside the document. One example, you can use hours. You can, in one single document, put a list of value inside one attribute. So in this case, the baseball glove has, specific, uh, is, has been designed for specific position on the field, infield, outfield, pitcher, and you see we put that in the simple list. Keep in mind that everything will be uh, able, you will be able to query on all of this field, including a value of an hour. Give me all the gloves that are for outfield you have the category that will be glove and you will query on the position that will be outfield for example so you can do the where clause in the same concept that you do uh, in a relational database not only you can have a simple list of value but it's key that you can embed inside one single document more complex objects so here for example using the same example with using the glove 
we add new attributes. As part of these attributes, we use, for example, who is a professional player that has endorsed this specific brand or the specific gloves. And we have one attribute, and inside these attributes, you have a sub-document, allowing you to make more complex objects in one single document. So what is interesting also to see here is I have complex attributes, complex value, and I can change the schema on the fly. If we go back, you can start with a very simple document like that. Depending of your requirements, depending of your applications, just add a new attribute that is a list. You add a new attribute that is a list of documents. And because they are rich structures, they will really represent the way you manipulate your objects in your application in Java. Most of the time, what we will see is the Java objects you manipulate in the cache of your application or behind the UI, behind your forms or your report, will be the document you can store initially inside your database. It makes the development a lot easier, and it removes the complexity of having many join to build behind the scene. Sometimes you don't see it, or most of the time we don't see it, because we use Hibernate or JPA or equivalent um, object relational mapping tool. Here it's a more direct mapping with one document on a complex object that might represent your business. So, as I said, one single product or one single type of document can manage many, many different structures. We see the bat, the gloves, the category stored in, wa in one single document each time, but you can query them on the different attributes. If you look for a bat, you will get the bat and the all the list of properties that are specific to this object. Same if you do the baseball, same if you do the gloves. Obviously, your application has to be able to deal with the different attributes, but the database natively uses these attributes. You don't have complex manipulation to do to kind of build a key value store inside our property value tables inside your schema to be able to add or remove or change the schema or the properties of a specific product. So it met really the document flexibility really makes the life a lot easier for the developer. And what you have to do is just think about how you build your forms or your HTML pages inside your documents. You just add pitch feature, you just add attributes as much as you need. You send that to the server. It's when it's become complex, but now we simplify a lot because you store the document almo almost as it is inside your application. So. Let's talk about the document design now that, now that we have seen why uh, documents are interesting or in which case they are interesting. One example being when you have polymorphism of the data, it's quite, impo it's quite interesting. So documents provide flexibi on perform flexibility on performance. I talk about the flexibility, you have seen it in the previous slide. We talk a lot also about performances or performance of your application. One of the reasons you, avo you avoid join, and join by definition are not bad, but keep in mind that many, many deployments of MongoDB has been built on many servers. So you have documents that are distributed on many physical machines. So if you support join, you don't know where is the documents that you, have you will have to be in relation with. It's typically what happened to relational database. It's when you start to have distributed database or partition database, it makes the join very complex. Or you have to really have a very complex business logic or technical logic inside your server, inside your schema to be sure that all the data you will query with the join are on the same server to avoid the complexity of going to multiple nodes to get the record. So we avoid that by just saying embed as much as you can as much as you can inside one single document, like that when you want to query, you will get everything in one single path. And we have also many options or operators to modify and add information inside the document. As I said before, relational databases, relational schema has been designed first for the storage, 
but provide also some interesting part. Queries are and, and join are still interesting. It's just a different way of working. One, I will say that the hardest part when you start to work with MongoDB, it's not the technical part. The hardest part is the document design. Because we don't have a magical uh, analysis tool or saying that you want to use a specific uh, normal form, saying the third form, norma the third normal form of the schema that will represent exactly that you don't duplicate data, you don't uh, you are specific, you don't repeat data in the same columns and this kind of stuff. With documents, the only thing that matters is how do you use your documents? What do you do with your data? It's really what is important when you build your application. So, thing about how do you manipulate data will be, do I want to do dynamic queries with many fields? Do I want atomic updates? Do I want to do aggregation and complex aggregation? And also, in addition to what is the volume, what is the schema itself, how do you read and write the data? How much write do you do compared to uh, the read? The type of queries you do, the type of updates, the life cycle, how big your data will be in a month, in six months, in a year, in ten years. Because it will have an impact not only on the database itself, on the servers itself, but also on the document. And we have to keep in mind that today, talking about read and write radio ratio, we see more and more applications dealing with a large volume of data, for example, for application logs, when they have terabytes of data that are ingested inside the database every day. So you want to be able to be sure that you can query, but in the same time, it's not only about storing the data, it's also about preparing the work to be sure that you can query them in a smart way, make sense of your data. So it's quite interesting as, a, as an experience to understand what is your data set, how do you work with your data, and which type of query you do. An important part, and this is key when you compare that with a relational database, changing the schema is a lot easier. If you make a mistake today, you won't necessarily pay the price very heavily in a few months or a few years, as soon as your data is still inside the database. So let's take some example of documents and patterns we can use. So for this, I took a very simple example about a uh, renting application for books, so books, author, publishers, and patrons, so customers that will take the boot out of uh, the library. In reality, we always have relations. So this is why we will talk about, uh, I will always focus on the relations, because we all know how to design a relational database, and the idea here is to try to see how it differs. So if we talk about the, path, uh, the patrons, so the, the users that want to rent the information of the book, and we put that in one single document, and the book itself in another document, it works. And this is exactly what you will do in a relational database. But that means every time you want to, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm ahead of what I'm thinking. It's a, a customer on his address. So if you design that in a relational way, you will have customer or patrons address in two different tables. And you can do the same. You can do one document for the customer or the patron, one address for, the, for his, uh, his address. And it's working, except that every time you want to get the information about this specific customer, these specific patrons, you have to get one document on another document. Remember, we don't have join. So instead of that, just let embed this address inside the document. Quite easy. Everything uh, is just, you serialize, serialize an object inside another object in Java, you will get this specific structure saved inside the database. If, if we do one too many, it's almost the same approach. You have one customer, his list of, his list of addresses in, inside the document. 
So same, we have one specific document that is the Python, but inside it, you have the list of addresses. And here, what is interesting is to think about what is happening. Because it's true that in every customer, I have his address. That means every time he moves or we have a family, we duplicate this information. Is it bad? Is it good? Honet honestly, it's just how often do you change this data that is key. It's, no, it's really not how it's designed. It's more the fact that if my application, and this is probably the case here, I am reading the data 99% of the case, it's OK. I don't care. Because if I need to update this specific address or add a new address, I have everything I need to manipulate this array inside the API. And we will take more example uh, with the books itself or themselves. So publishers, as you can guess, they publish many, many books. But the books have one single publisher. So how do you represent that? So let's take an example with one of the Mongo book. Uh, so you have these different attributes, like the title, the author, the publish date, the number of page, the language, and the publisher that is, in this case, Aurelie. So the first approach to start to design your application is to take this and save it as it is, or at least the first part of the design. So you will say, OK, let's take the book, the title, the author, and all these attributes. But one of the issues we have, it's here, we said that the publisher has many, many, many books. So the full attributes of the publisher uh, will be uh, the full documents, the full attributes will be in every single book. Is it good? Probably not in this case, because we can change maybe the name of the company, or maybe the location, or anything else that just in terms of volume you will store, it's quite, it's quite big. So what you will do, you will, in this case, kind of normalize something you have initially denormalized by creating two documents the publisher on the book, and what you have to do is to choose how do you want to make the relation between them. So in this case, we see we don't have a relation. I didn't put any attribute in the publisher to point to the book, or to the book to point to the publisher. One way will be to take the publisher ID, orally, I have added one field that is underscore ID, and I put that also as a publisher underscore ID in my books itself. So now we have kind of a join, not a join, sorry, we have a reference between the two documents. But you can do the opposite. You can say, let's put an ID on the book and put this specific ID inside the publisher, inside an array, because I can create a list of value in one single document. So in this case, the publisher will have all its book. And this is where, again, you have so to think about what are your data, how they are used, how big is the data set, and how much information do you need, and, and how do you access it. So arrays of books inside of a publisher make sense when you have many, but when many is just few of them, is a handful of them. It's not thousands of thousands of thousands. Um, what you can say is, if you know the size of the list you have to put inside an array, it's a good idea. If it will continue to grow, it's probably a bad idea. Typically, in this case, the publisher, every month, will publish new books, so the it will continue to grow. From a technical point of view, also inside MongoDB, and I'm not even talking about the design here, I'm talking just about how it works, we have a physical limitation of 16 megabytes. So you may hit this limitation for one single document by adding books and books and books and books in one single document. And also, the way it's organized, the way it's indexed, it's probably not the best way. So in the same time, referencing a publisher in one book, first, we know the size. It's one single publisher for a book. So it makes sense. And 
It's useful, so in this case, if you understand exactly what will be the size, for example, the tags that you can put on a book could be a good idea to put an inside an array. So it's something new, so it's something that you cannot do today in relational database, so it's something you have to think about when you design your application. Where do you want to put the keys? In which uh, kind of order I want to organize my access to the data? And I will show you that we can go further than that in a minute. So one too many. So typically a customer can have multiple books and a books can be uh, lent uh, by mul multiple uh, customers. But in the same times we know from the application business logic or just for just uh, what we do with books, you cannot have thousands of books in the same time. So what you will do in this case, so you will check out, you will do uh, the customer on the books and you can add inside the, the, the customer itself the list of books on the date of the checkout. It's great, but here what I have, I just have an idea of the book. I have a list of checkouts sorted by date, but in the same time I have the first, it's an ID, the second attribute, it's a date. If I want to get the list of books so, um, for this specific customer, I will just retrieve the ID. So I want to put in the same document more attributes to do what we call the data locality. In this case, I just improve my schema by in the list of the checkout, I have not only the ID of the book, but I also duplicate a part of the information, like the title and the author, and I keep the date. Why it is interesting? It's because, or oh, more than why it's interesting is to get everything in one uh, call, but how do you design? Well, you just focus on what you do with your data. Typically, you know that when you will look at a specific customer, you probably need to get the list of books he has, uh, he has read lately from the library. And what is interesting in, inside a book? The title and the list of author. You don't need to, to, uh, to get all the information. You just choose the ones that you need for your application. And what is interesting and important to understand is, in this case, this value is immutable. When you have checked out the book, the book has a specific title that it will not change. The book has a specific author that won't change. And the, on the checkout date, it's a date that was when the customer was here to take the book. So it makes a lot of sense to just put that in one single document because you will access it all the time in a read manner and you probably never mod modify the existing value. What you will do, you will add more values to the array. So you can add and remove value if you want and we have all the operation to manipulate these specific things. So if we look at the referencing versus embedding the data, embedding, if we want really to compare to relational database, it's like a pre-join. We kind of aggregate all the data that we need in one single document. And when we have one single document with an embedded, docu uh, with an embedded document, uh, the document level operations are very, very easy because you can access to all the attributes on sub-documents, on attributes of these sub-documents. You, you can have as many as you want, or at least as many as your brain can manage. Uh, it's really part of one parent that you will manipulate. So it makes the life uh, easy to manipulate, but in the same time, you lose some flexibility especially when we are talking about upgrade, updating many documents or many attributes very often. So you have to think about really once again about how do you manipulate your data. So, oops, sorry. One, um, one thing that I wanted to show that it's quite interesting also is we could do the same with books on author but it was our, do our books on publisher, is you can enrich the value you are denormalizing. In this case, I have books and 
I have author, a list of author inside another, what we call a collection of documents. And he has a specific ID, he has a specific name, and the location. And inside the book, I created a sub-document, and this document contains the ID of the author, but it's in the same time, for whatever reason, they could use a nickname, or they could use a name before uh, they change the name when they were marri uh, married or something. Because if you look at it, when the book has been published, the name of this author was A, maybe today the name is B, but the name of the author that was published is really A. So you want to store and denormal denormalize at this specific time. And you can find many examples of embedding data to make the life easier when you manipulate the information. And sometimes, this is the case, we have inconsistent data in the database. Because in one case, I have here a name that is, I don't even remember, K awesome. And inside my uh, author, I have another name that is Christina. Is it, ba is it bad? Honestly, it really depends on your application. In this case, uh, she wanted to be known as Kehosom when she built this book. In the same time, you have the ID, so you can always check if you need to do massive upgrade or if you want to say, give me the real name of the author, you can always get this information. And if you think about it, you have many other use cases where it will be even simpler. It will simplify your life as a developer of a standard application. Talk about an invoice, an invoice or an order management system. When you publish the order or the invoice, you have a specific name, address, list of item, uh, item descriptions. All this kind of stuff has been sent to the, to the customer on a PDF, on an email, on the website. And you want to be sure that the name that you use in the system is the name that the person has received uh, or the labels of the person that has received because most of the time, uh, an invoice, when it has been sent to the customer, you cannot modify it. So in this case, by denormalizing and storing the document entirely, will just make the life easier instead of having to manage intermediary tables or uh, kind of checkpoint inside your database. So if you want to go further, the first thing will be to test the product and use the product. But uh, we have many information on the documentation that we use to document specific use cases. We have product catalog, we have application logs, we have uh, uh, social network and commands management and this kind of stuff, webinars and books. And tomorrow afternoon, I think I'm doing a, a workshop where you can come with your laptop and discover the product. We have three hours to discover the product. You won't create your own documents. We will use an existing document that has used all this complex structure to understand how you can manipulate them. So uh, do you have any questions? Yeah. yeah. So the question is, what do you do when you are in production and when you have to change a schema? or uh, modify the attributes on the structure. So it really depends. Um, so in many applications, what people are doing when they know that they will have a lot of evolutions, they, they tag the inside the document, they put a version number, version of the application schema, kind of, just to be sure that do I have to do something special with that? And based on the application logic, you will choose what you do. And you have three ways of doing stuff. You can do a big, massive update using your code and say, I want to change all the documents to add or modify this type. And this is your application code that you will, you will do that. And you have some object document mapping. So the same way you have object relational mappings, you have some object document mapping like, for example, Morphia or Django in Java, Mongoose in, uh, in Node.js that, that help you to say when I want to modify your type or modify or add an attribute, do that automatically to all the documents. Another approach is you do that lazily. So you get the document out of the database, and you know that you, since you have the version number of one way of knowing, 
you will change only this document. And in some cases, you just don't change. And this is an example of, do you know Craigslist? Craigslist, it's classified, it's a big uh, website in the US when you can, you know, like a eBay kind of, uh, but a, a less advanced system, but it's ve a lot, very, very, very used. And one of the stuff they have done is all the history, for legal reasons, they have to keep everything that was on their website. So they put an archive inside MongoDB. But their website, that is on My MySQL, continue to be improved. So not only they, st they keep only, I think, three months. I don't know exactly if it's three months or six months. But when they add or modify the structure here, they don't touch to the existing million of documents they have in this specific location because this is only used for BI, this is only used for analytics. So they don't really care. If the attribute is not here or if the attribute has a different type, the query will react differently. Hi, I have some practical question. Uh, how would you design a schema where, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, books and customers and we need to uh, quickly search uh, what uh, are the readers of the books and uh, the other service is, uh, I don't know, searching the books which uh, was read but ca by customers. So uh, we need to fast search the both ways. So can we put uh, book ID on customer and customer ID on book or how would you resolve that? So you can for sure put the ID on both sides. Um, but after that, it's really, you can choose to, um, so you want to search, yeah, I have to rephrase. So uh, you want to search by who are the readers and? Okay. so. Readers of books and books read by. So the way I will do it, I will probably based on, on ma if it's a standard library where you don't have billions of users, I will duplicate the information in both. I will have an array of, uh, no, uh, not an array, but uh, not inside one single document, but we'll have a set of documents that contain the author on the list of books he has read, and I can query that. In addition to the standard just uh, a link to the books inside the user. What, uh, what is interesting about this, uh, this uh, questions, not saying that is, for me it's hard to kind of design on the fly, <laughs> but what is very important is typically these kind of questions and do not hesitate to denormalize. It's not an issue to duplicate the information multiple times. As soon as you have the space on disk, it's not an issue to have in the user the, the idea of the books on the books, in the books, I won't take. I would not put all the users because you don't know how big it will be. So it will grow too fast to 16 megabytes, for example. But I will put another document that kind of a log of all activity. This one will be very nice for analytics kind of stuff for this kind of queries. Other questions? Um, MongoDB specifies something like write concern. Um, ah, I don't know where when. I who is uh, just. Uh, here? Okay, thank you. <laughs> when, as a developer, I should concern which right concern is right? Okay. So, I will first I will explain what the right concern is. Um, MongoDB is, has been designed to be highly available and scalable. So, it has two concepts. One of the concepts is the sharding that allow you to distribute the database on many nodes. This will give you scalability. And the other part is the replication. Replication, as, a, as you can guess, I think this term is more uh, known by, by users. So it's just we copy the data automatically for you. So inside one shard or one partition of the database, you have multiple uh, copy of the data. It's what we call a replica set. You can have many of them. Let's say you have, for simplicity reason, we have three nodes in this replica set. When you saved inside the database, you only save on one node that is, at this specific moment of time, the primary node for this specific operation. And by default, you will only save on this node and give you back to the application saying, I have saved the document. 
without checking if it has been copa uh, copied on the other node. It will eventually happen, but you don't control it. So if your system is reliable, you will say, maybe I can only save on this document. Or if this specific information is not that critical. Suppose your application is just ingesting tweets. If you exactly after saving this document, this box explodes without copying, you may lose some data in this case. So what you will do, I, don't, I want to be sure that I never, never lose any data in my system. You will use what we call the write concern to say, I want to write, but give me the feedback that has been it has been successful only when I want to write on all the three nodes. It's kind of inside your application. Suppose you build an e-commerce website. So when you capture all the clicks of the user, when he puts something in the cart, click, I choose this product, click, I choose this product, click, I choose this product. Is it that bad if in a very, very unfortunate case, meaning when you save on the server, this server is just disappearing for network reason, hardware reason, you just say he has to reselect it. So you will say, I don't need any right concern because probability will never happen and it's not the core of my business. It's sometimes when you see errors like sessions on man session management on your website, it's typically the kind of stuff that happen. But what you want to be sure, it's when you have selected all the product and you do the checkout. I have that in my cart and I want to be sure that everything that I selected, I booked on checkout, I will do a right concern. Just to be sure that this specific operation has been not only saved on one single node, but copy on a replica. And in the way you do replication on white concern, you can even choose on which data center, just to be sure that you have some nodes in this specific data center, some nodes in the other data center, and you will say, I want to have at least one copy here and one copy here. Does it answer your questions? Yep. It's really, really the durability options. As a developer, you choose how you want to be sure it has been saved on disk on how many machines. Okay, thank you. And other questions? No? <laughs> Don't move your arm. <laughs> so I'm here for the three days, so do not hesitate if you have any questions. And see you tomorrow if you come to do the, the workshop. Thank you. <laughs>